if you would, go to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to be there and uh, spending, spending our time out of that passage this morning. And as I was preparing for uh, this series this year. We've, we every year go through a marriage series, and what does that look like? How does that play out is always a little bit different, and, and this year I, I've really decided to start from a different kind of point of view, if you will, and a lot of times we talk about marriage and give instruction, and we talk about the realities of relationships and how they can break down and how, according to God, they're supposed to be put back together, and in, we're not going to start there this, this year. We're starting in a different place because I think as we go through, and uh, part of this actually came out of a conversation uh, that I had with one of our, our youth leaders uh, as we prepare to deal with this reality of what does the Bible say about sex. Now, here's the thing. We are going to be talking about that in youth group. We'll give you a heads up, moms and dads that have uh, students in the youth group, and we will get your permission on that. We'll let you know. We're going to have a parent meeting on all those things. But, but the way we talk about that reality with our children is hugely determinative as to what they think about sex. Now, it is the exact same thing with marriage. How we talk about it and how we present it has a massive impact on how we think it should be or could be. And so we are going to start from what can it be, all right? Because I, I think with like sex ed with your kids, if you just tell them, no, it's evil, don't touch it, like, okay, well, then they're going to get information from somebody else, and if they know from you that all you're going to tell them is, no, it's evil, don't touch it, like, okay, um, that's, that's all I'll get from my mom and dad, and they put this guilt thing in my mind about all these, di is that where we need to start with that conversation? I think there's a better way to go about it. And as we talk about marriage, the way I want to start is, what is God's perfect design for it? And if we can wrap our brains around how amazing this opportunity of relationship called marriage is, then all the don'ts and all the no's and all that kind of stuff, they are still good guide points, but they are not the thing that drive us in our marriage. What drives us in our marriage, hopefully, as we go through this process, will be Man, what can it be? What can the relationships of my life look like? And what can this primary relationship called marriage look like? So today, we're going to actually have a little bit of role-playing, and I'm going to ask for some volunteers here in just a little bit. But before we jump into that, I, I want to get to this passage in Genesis. This is the first marriage ceremony. This is the first wedding, okay? Uh, just off the top of your head, if you haven't looked at it yet, who might be getting married in this passage? Anyone? Adam and Eve. All right, good. Good answer. All right, so here's where we're going to start, because this is really God's design for it, and where your notes start is this, and we always lay this down because I want this to be ingrained in every fiber of your being. The way we define love, and the way we define it comes out of Scripture, but the way we as a church define love is love is you first, not me. That's, it's very simple, it's very boiled down, it's very, like, almost overly simplistic, but not really, because if you apply that in every single relationship where you are intending to express love, love according to how God loves is you first, not me. Now, God's God. He has the right to everything. It's all His. Does He demand it? No. He actually gives of Himself sacrificially every single time. You first, not me. Okay, so that's, that's love. We're going to start there. But Genesis chapter 2, verse 21 through 25 says this. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. Why? Well, here's the thing. Just prior to this passage, if you want to read the rest of this on your own some other time, it goes through the fact that God made all these wonderful things, and Adam was working with him. It was a great time, but there was no suitable helper found for Adam. And the only thing that was not good in all of creation, according to God, he said it's not good that man should be alone. And so, this is where this passage pick up. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while the man slept, the Lord God took out of the man's, uh, took one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. 
Verse 23 says, at last, the man exclaimed, why? Because Adam had gone through the process of naming all the animals and seeing all of the other options out there. And none of them were right. That doesn't, nope, that's not, nope, not, nope, that, and it's not good for man to be alone. And so God makes woman, and he says, at last, the man exclaimed. Now, guys, before you got married, like, I know you were in this process of dating and all this kind of stuff. I don't know how it was for you, but when I talked to Jamie for the first time on the phone, and I didn't see her yet, I was like, at last, like, my soul was at peace. Because I knew this is the one. At last, the man exclaimed, This one is bone of my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. Amen. All right. I added the last word there. Um, it's important, by the way, that you look at the quotes to see who's, who's speaking here. The last part, verse 24, is the author's writing. Uh, the thing that is in quotes is what Adam was saying, all right? This one is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. You will be called woman because she was taken from man, end quote. Now the author is saying, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united as one. It's the first wedding ceremony. Uh, so let's break this down. I don't I don't know if you've ever had this done. I don't know if you've ever been talked through why our wedding ceremonies are the way they are, and they have literally gotten down to like, do you? Yes. Do you? Yes. Great. Get out of here. Um, they're, they're so short now. They are so fast, but there are some real pieces of importance as we go through this wedding thing. But what we're going to look at first is what happened here. Let's look at what took place in this wedding, who took the action in this wedding? God did. God did all of the action. Put man to sleep, took out a rib, made a woman, woke the man up, presented to him his bride. All Adam did was respond. Interesting. Very interesting, in this process of, of right relationship according to God, we can come to the understanding that God is going to take action in our lives, in our relationships, if we will function according to the... Did Adam have other options? Really? He was looking up to this point, right? He didn't like any of the other options, which, good for him, like... No, Adam, don't do that. Like, I'm sure God was giving some instruction. But it was finally, once God had made this one, this is the right thing. Which means the other options are not the right thing. How often do we rush into relationship and relationships that are not the right thing because we're unwilling to wait for God to bring us his action. So, some things as we go through, and you got a lot of fill in the blanks, and if you want to fill those in, that's wonderful. If you don't, that's great. Just follow along. There are big things happening here, and we can miss them if we don't pay attention. The first one is this, that spiritual authority and protection are God's. Who was doing all the action? It was God. Who took care of Adam? It was God. Who made Eve? It was God. Who kept Eve and presented her to Adam? It was God. God has spiritual authority and protection. They are all His. And He gives us spiritual authority. Why do we see that? As we go through and continue on in this passage, we're not going to get to all those things, but God speaks a kind of authority into the lives of Adam and Eve. And then once sin enters in and Adam and Eve kind of go their own way and go against God, God realigns authority at that time even. So he gives us spiritual authority. The third one is this. God values man. Next one is this. God values woman. Why? Literally, in the Genesis account, man and woman are the pinnacle of God's creation. In his heart and in his mind. He interacts in 
nothing close to a similar way with anything else that he has created, just with man and woman. And the fifth thing is this, that God's authority and covering are on the woman. How do we see that? And we're going to see that kind of as we walk through uh, here in just a little bit. We're going to perform a wedding um, on a married couple, whoever volunteers here in just a little bit. But we're going to walk through and see, what is that thing? Why, Why do we do that? But God's authority and covering are on the woman, and he passes his covering to the man. And the woman and the man are one under God's authority and covering still. So you have all those things. I want you to keep those in mind because we're going to walk through a wedding ceremony. Who wants to get married again? Joe and Michelle, thank you so much. Come on. (laughs) Tony, can you be Michelle's dad just for today? All right. You guys go to the back if you would. Thank you. you. You're up here with me. Awesome. Uh, so here's the deal. The way this typically happens when I've performed weddings, I think I've done like 60 or something like that. Uh, me and the groom, we come in first. Now here's just some instruction because I've done weddings here in the United States long enough and watched the decline of people's understanding of what's supposed to happen. When the pastor and the groom walk in from here on out, like automatically that should be a sign that the wedding is starting. Okay? I've had to whistle at weddings, by the way, to get them to like, shh, we're going. That used to not be a problem because everybody knew when the pastor and the groom came in, this thing's starting. Okay? Interesting. What is taking place right here? Who am I? I'm the pastor. Who do I represent? God. Okay? I am the authority put in place by God to officiate this thing. And so, now I understand, I'm not God. I get that. And at the same time, called as a pastor, ordained to his ministry, I represent him and I serve him and I am his person in this place to do the work that he does. And so, We have very literally in every single wedding ceremony that I've done, God represented and man represented. And then we have this really other interesting thing that takes place, okay? The father comes in with the daughter. Who does the father represent? God. Quite literally, The Father represents the spiritual, physical, emotional covering for the daughter. Now, it doesn't always happen this way. I understand that. I've done many weddings where it wasn't the Father that gave the daughter away. And that, it's it's reality. And we move forward with it, but we have a representative saying, you know what? I will take responsibility. I will cover. I will place my authority in protection of this precious thing. And so, come on down, guys. There you go. It's a big day. I know, right? <laughs> dun, dun. That's a wrong march, isn't it? No. <laughs> Turn and face me here. All right. So here's the thing, Joe, you're going to be right here with me. This is how we stage this. And I usually walk this through with the couples that I'm marrying so that they understand what's happening and they understand the importance of this. I want you all to know this just in case I didn't do your wedding. All right. But the reality of this is that dad does not give her away automatically. You know why? If you've ever paid attention at a wedding, there are supposed to be two sets of vows. Not just the vows that are exchanged here. There are two times where vows are exchanged. And the first one is promises, saying between the man and the woman, particularly to the representation of God who is covering the woman, saying, I promise that I will take care of her. Okay, so the first set of vows are vows that are not just saying, like, I love you and I'll love you forever. It's not that yet, that's later. This set of vows goes through, will you honor? Will you comfort? Will you do all of the things in this woman's life that up until this point have been my responsibility as the father who covers my daughter with the spiritual authority that God has given me? Dads, step up for your daughters, okay? 
cover them, protect them. With not just physically, emotionally. Because when it comes time to give her away, you ought to only be doing that with somebody that you trust to take care of your daughter. Okay? So the first set of vows are exchanged. Okay? And it's really interesting what happens next. Okay? The pastor, God says, who gives this woman to be married to this man? It is not until then that the exchange is supposed to happen. Because the dad says, I am relinquished. Ooh, I'm going to cry here. <laughs> Just did father-daughter dance last night, so you've got to give me a little break. <laughs> it's not on my mind at all. Um, but the father says, I, in your presence, God, trust this man to take care of my daughter. Pull it together, farmer. <laughs> Not even real wedding, but I love you guys, so this is working good. All right. <sighs> All right, I'm going to make it through. <laughs> so, at this point, this is what's supposed to happen. All right? Dad doesn't just go sit down. Dad does something. Dad, you know, kisses daughter. However, that's, you don't have to do that. It'd be a little <laughs> weird at this point, so we're going to hold off on that. But typically... The veil is lifted. The covering is lifted. Dad kisses his daughter, puts the veil back down, and doesn't just walk away. Dad takes daughter's hand. Take this hand right here. Daughter stays. Husband steps up, takes this hand, and dad steps back. You step in, and now Dad goes and sits down. Stay here, now you stand by her and put, nope, 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 there, there we go. Now, there. Always covered is the bride. Never once in a wedding ceremony is the bride supposed to be alone. Not ever is she supposed to be standing there like, nope. Constant covering because there's a covering that has been passed from God Represented by the Father, because God gave that authority, that spiritual authority, to the Father to protect his daughter. And now, that authority has been passed on to the husband. Now, it's interesting what continues to happen here, because all of this happens down here, right? If you've paid attention at a wedding ceremony, if it's in a church, which I've only done like three weddings in a church because apparently nobody likes to get married in a church anymore. There's a reason though that these things happen and they're staging this way because after these vows have been done at this level, then the pastor leads the bride and groom up onto the stage. Come on up guys. Yeah. So stay right in front of me. What did we just do? We stepped up. Literally meaning, this has been brought into the presence of God. This new relationship that they are covenanting to enter into, they are doing in the presence of God. All of that other stuff was reality in the world being transitioned into spiritual reality now. Okay, And it is here that then I have the bride and groom face each other. Look deeply into each other's <laughs> eyes. Repeat after me. I, Joe, I, Joe. Take, you, Michelle, take you, Michelle, to do the things that we've already done before. <laughs> Perfect. And then I, Michelle, I, Michelle. take you, Joe, take you, Joe, to do all the things we've done before. All right, good. <laughs> and it is here that these new vows, a redefinition of all of life takes place. For richer and for poorer, in sickness and in health, literally in all things, I will be yours, are exchanged both ways. Okay? This reality of the yielding of the father to the husband, the taking of the husband of the wife, the wife taking of the husband, this new relationship now exists, and it says it's for this relationship that a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two shall become one. Okay? One. So, who is this relationship between? This is a question I'm asking you. Man, 
Man, woman, and God. I don't know how many weddings you've been to, but typically there's a passage from Ecclesiastes spoken about that how can one be warm alone? But if two are together, they're great and they can fight off an attacker, but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This is supposed to happen in the presence of God. This relationship. This happened the very first time in the presence of God. God did it. He made it. And he said, that, that's good. Thank you guys, you can go sit down. All right. So, just some things I want to recap for you. This is what God intends marriage to be. This is his desire for it. This is his design for it. And it is good. We can really screw it up. We have that potential. But the way God has designed it is good. Now, the world has disagreement about this. The world has disagreement with God's design for it. But guess what? We're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about God's design for it. That he made the man and he made the woman. He presented the woman to the man. And I'm sure was like, dude, you thought the rest of creation was cool. <laughs> Wait for it. Because this is, this is the best right here. Ladies, you are precious in God's sight, okay? You are absolutely wonderful to Him. You are so valuable to Him that He has placed His covering personally on you. Whether your dad was awesome or whether your dad was a complete tool bag, God has chosen to cover you Himself. Are you hearing me, ladies? I want you to, like, don't listen to all the voices in your own heads that say, oh, I'm a terrible, whatever you say you're terrible at. You're awesome, according to God, so much so that He is willing to cover you personally. He is willing to provide for you personally. He's willing to protect you personally. Guys, God values you tremendously and has trusted you tremendously. That's what he thinks of you. He loves you that much that he's willing to trust you. Dads, if, if you have a daughter, think about that for a little bit. If you don't yet have a daughter or you'll never have a daughter, imagine you did, okay? Who would you trust enough to give her to? I hope in that process, I, and I know, I've done enough weddings to know that not always is dad like, I really like this guy. No, a lot of times it's like, I wish you'd pick somebody else. I'm like, well, that's not what we're here to discuss today, so <laughs> let's get over that for now, all right? <laughs> but it, because relationships have been broken, a lot of times, dads, we have this lack of trust, lack of belief that this young man is going to be able to do the job even better than I have of providing for my daughter because I tell you what, I don't want to give my daughter away until she has found a man that can do it better in her life of protecting her and loving her and completing the reality of what God has designed than I can because I know I am just a steward of my daughter. She's been, oh, good grief. <laughs> She's been placed in my arms for a while. I am not one with my daughter. That design by God is for someone else. And I look forward to the day that she finds that out. I kind of do and I kind of don't, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but my goodness... I want that for her because I know what that has meant in my life. And I want that kind of blessing in her life. That level of love is what God has for you, ladies. And that level of love and trust is what God has for you, gentlemen. So let's 
take what God has designed and function inside of that and see what his blessing does. This is the, the last statement. I know we're, we're cooking along here, so we're just going to finish up with this. Righteous marriage protects and safeguards the hearts of those in the covenant that is between God and man and woman. Let me read it one more time. You can write it down. Righteous marriage protects and safeguards the hearts of those in the covenant that is between God and man and woman. I have a question for you, by the way. Have you ever once thought that when you entered into this marriage thing, that you had the potential to hurt God's heart, not just your mates? God's in this covenant relationship called marriage. If we have done it before Him and given ourselves to Him, He's there. He's in it. And when we function in ways that protect and we function in ways that safeguard, we're not just safeguarding, gentlemen, the heart of your wife. Ladies, you're not just safeguarding the heart of your husband. You're safeguarding the heart of God. Marriage can be an act of worship that makes God's heart happy. That is awesome to me. That just in my marriage, I can show God love. Now there is a flip side to that, that yeah, when we blow it up, do you think God's like, eh, good try. No, he's, he's broken with us when relationship breaks. Because he values us. He loves us. He has protected us. Let's not short it by thinking less of marriage. Let's elevate this thing and say, God, this is awesome. Thank you. And if I'm not yet there, I'm not yet married, or maybe I was and that fell apart, Lord, my relationship with you is one where I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to believe, Lord, that you have my absolute best in mind. And so I'll be patient, like Adam was patient. Have any of you seen every animal in the world? No? Can you imagine how long that would take? We have no idea the time frame, the timeline of where Adam was naming the animals. And like, I don't know, it's just stupid long neck giraffe. Not for me. Went through all of them. And then finally, are you willing to wait for what God has? Are you willing to keep yourself only for what God has presented to you, gentlemen? Are you willing to keep yourself only for the one whom God has brought you to, ladies? What he has designed is good. It is the kind of good that makes the way we say good sound like a slap in the face because we say good like, how's your day? Oh, that's good. And we kind of have this, no, when God says something is good, it is right. It is so right, everybody involved just goes, oh, it's exactly what it's supposed to be. That's what God has in mind for your marriage. That's what God has in mind for your life if you are not married. That the relationships around you that God has blessed you with can be ones that happen in His presence. That's where we're setting the stage today. We're going to keep building on this. All right. So if somebody comes in next week and sits down next to you that wasn't here this week, tell them, hey, you need to go on mychurchaz.com and listen to last week's to understand the foundation that God intended marriage to be. Okay? Now, we're going to get into the outcome of this. Because typically, not always, but typically the outcome of two people being brought together in God's sight are more little people. And this reality impacts their reality. We're going to deal with some of that, but we'll get to that. Let's pray. Lord, you are good. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your design of what marriage is supposed to be. 
And God, as we continue through this process, this month of looking at your design for it, Lord, I pray that you will soften our hearts to each other. Lord, I pray for the marriages that are represented here right now, that over the course of this month, God, you will do a work of healing in marriages that might be hurting. That, God, you will bind together what has been broken, because time and life have this tendency to hurt sometimes, and sometimes we tend to hurt each other. But, God, as we look at your word, as we look at your intent for marriage, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will move in the lives of each person in your church. I pray that you will accomplish what you desire to accomplish in the families represented here. And Lord, let us be a completely different view of marriage to this world that has a broken view of marriage. Lord, send us out as your examples of what marriage can be, of what you want to do in marriage, of how you take action in marriage, God. You are so good. We praise you and we thank you. And Lord, as we go through this process, we commit with you right now that we will submit to you. That if there's something said from your word that we disagree with, then God, we will put our will aside and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. In my marriage, with my kids, in my family, in this world, not my will, but yours be done. God, we covenant with you again right now to say, you first, not me. Lord, lead us in this process. Point out the things that need to be dealt with. And God, cover us with your protection in that process because, Lord, you know that when hurts get brought up, Sometimes it just reopens wounds instead of healing them. But God, your desire is healing. So Holy Spirit, be present with us in a manifest way. That as you walk us through these things, your desire is to heal us. Your desire is to bring your remedy and your wholeness into our relationships. So God, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you. And Lord, as we continue to worship you now, We give you thanks with our mouths, with our lives, with our words, and God also with our giving. Lord, you've been so generous with us, and we just want to be generous with you. And so as the ushers are coming forward right now, Lord, we commit to you our tithes and offerings and say, God, I trust you. I love you. So, Lord, we give right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.